We're very happy to have him here again, Chaitanya Charan Das. Um, he's a, a monk from, he, currently he lives in the Govardhan Eco Village, just, you know, a couple hours outside of Mumbai. But we also know him as the spiritual scientist. He's a brilliant engineer, as well as a brilliant bhakti yogi. And uh, we always, uh, personally, I feel that Chaitanya Charan Prabhu is really one of the best communicators of bhakti. You know, he's got a, he's got a, 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 a brain that is like very, um, dexterous and, and and he's it is the it, it in one sense it's the brain of a of an engineer but he he's able to in, in so many helpful ways uh explain bhakti philosophy make it practical make it understandable for us so chaitanya charan what chaitanya charan prabhu welcome back to wisdom of the sages thank you kasubru for inviting me delighted to be here with you and as Wonderful far as the expressness of the brain is concerned i would say that <laughs> I learned from your podcast a lot about <laughs> okay. how to, <laughs> you know, how to how to share bhakti in a very accessible, sensitive, as well as consistent way. So I'm grateful to be well, here and to be of some service. We're learning from you, actually. So, but thank you. And, and um, you know, we we were thinking about what's a good topic to discuss today, and. and I thought let's let's tie it into what we've been reading recently in the Bhagavatam. Now we're in the fourth canto of Shrimad Bhagavatam. And uh, the fourth canto opens up, it gets pretty pretty quick, it gets pretty exciting. You know, um, we, we were in the third canto, we went through, I don't know, about nine chapters, which are more didactic. It was the teachings of Kapila Dev to Devahuti, just one-on-one -on -one questions and answers going back and forth. But as soon as we enter that fourth canto, quickly we find ourselves thrown into some very exciting pastimes and stories. And uh, right off the bat, you have this story about Daksha, very interesting character. Um, and, and I want to speak to you about who Daksha is, but just to briefly share with you where we're at right now in Bhagavatam. We hear about Daksha and he's at a, he, he enters into a, uh, now Daksha, for those, you know, I, I found that a lot of people uh, listen, as, like some people listen to Wisdom Sages just like the interview days or just like the question and answers days. So for people that aren't following along with us every day, we're reading in the Bhagavatam on the weekdays. Daksha is this very important universal figure. He's, he's very respected. He's known as one of the Prajapatis, which means his universal responsibility is in relation to populating the universe. Um, he's, a very, he's seen as a very highly placed, influential religious figure. And his mood or his outlook in life, you could, you could categorize it as very Vedic and very karmic. In other words, he was living a life of regulations, a life of ritual, a life of religious ritual um, in a very precise way with the goal of receiving very um, precise, um, I, I guess you could say, um, results. And so we hear about Dakshi, he walks into a, into a, a, a public assembly where everyone immediately stands to respect him, but Lord Shiva doesn't get up. Now, Lord Shiva happens to be his son-in-law, and he feels very insulted by this. He becomes angry, and he begins to speak very harsh words against Lord Shiva, as well as cursing uh, Lord Shiva. Their whole, you know, Lord Shiva's followers stand up, and they fight back, and they have their words and curses, and curses and counter-curses are going on between the community of Daksha and his religious followers, and the community of Lord Shiva, who are very kind of like a unusual group of characters who are um, tamasic in a sense, like some of their qualities wouldn't appear to be so Vedic or religious. At the same time, they have a very sincere kind of attachment or very sincere kind of devotion to Lord Shiva, which is something of substance. So uh, fast forward, and we find that Shiva's wife, Daksha's daughter, Sati, wants to go to a big event at, at Daksha's home. Uh, Shiva warns her that your father doesn't like me very much and he's not going to have bad bad things to say about me and I don't think you're going to have a good time and I don't think it's a good idea, but if you really want to go, you can go. So she goes. Uh, Daksha treats her uh, very coldly and she gets up and in a very dramatic way begins to condemn Daksha and, and, and uh, uh, condemn his, his, his outlook and his consciousness and where he's at. And then she very dramatically commits suicide by like, um, like just uh, she's 
did this yogic power to draw the fire out of the body and she she in front of everyone commits suicide chaos ensues Daksha has his head cut off and um, all of his followers have to go to Lord Brahma and say, we don't know what to do now. Everything's a big mess. Brahma instructs them, you've offended a great personality just because Lord Shiva looks different. It doesn't mean that he's not a great, so he's actually a one incredibly deep, important, uh, devoted soul. You need to go and apologize to him. Everyone goes to him. They apologize. And now we're at the point where now they're back with Daksha trying to do this ceremony again and lord vishnu appears but this is what i would i'm sorry and i'm sorry if that took a while but this is what i would like to get uh, ask you start start our conversation with prabhu is what is bhagavatam trying to illustrate here and, and uh, how how can or at least um how can it be applied or, or what is a message that we're meant to take with this that may be very practical in, in our current you know world yeah it is at one level, the stories from the Bhagavatam can seem very, uh, very strange. The strangeness mm -hmm. can be from three different perspectives. First is from the perspective of uh, the kind of beings that are there and the kind of abilities they have. Like say, uh, as you said, uh, a person's head being replaced with a goat's head, something like that. Yeah. So those are things which can sound very, seem very strange. The forms that people have and the abilities that people have, mm -hmm. they can also seem strange. And the third thing is even sometimes the actions that people do. Now, for example, say the Sati, Sati ends their life by self-immolation. So the actions can also seem a little strange. But underlying all these, there are some things which are very common, which are, you could say, not mm -hmm. just common, universal. That one of okay. the things is that uh, choices, characters have to make choices. Their choices have consequences. Mm -hmm. And those choices are made with some contemplation. Mm -hmm. So the essential point is that we also live in a world where we have to make choices. And our choices do have consequences. And what can we contemplate by which we can choose wisely? Okay. So that's the, so in terms of the abilities, the actions, the attributes, there are differences. But in terms mm -hmm. of choices, contemplation and consequences, there are universals. Mm -hmm. So choices, if we get, contemplations and consequences. And consequences. Okay. So now exactly what the characters contemplate may be different because they are in a particular situation. So in one sense, if we consider even now in today's world, we have... Uh, something, uh, say we have Star Wars or we have uh, so many Harry Potter. Now people watch it at one level for the action, but then they contemplate, okay, this character chose like this at this point, this chose like this at this point. And there's a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of thought and analysis of what did this character did the right thing or the wrong thing, what happened. Mm -hmm. So broadly the Bhagavatam's purpose is, you could say twofold. One is the Bhagavatam is spoken to Parikshit Maharaj to help him to remember Krishna. So that is the ultimate mm -hmm. purpose. Mm -hmm. But how does remembrance of Krishna uh, manifest in the course of events in life? So in one sense, this whole pastime of Daksha is a pastime in which Lord Krishna doesn't appear much. Neither Krishna nor Vishnu appears much. It's more of Shiva and now Shiva, as we know, is one of the devatas within the broad, uh, <clears throat> broad Vedic system of administration of the universe. That is, is one of the most powerful beings in the universe. But the idea is overall, this pastime is illustrating that once we, once our consciousness becomes separated from a transcendental purpose, and remembering Krishna is actually the ultimate transcendental purpose. Remembrance, mm -hmm. remem because Krishna is is the being who will fulfill our hearts longing for lasting love and lasting life. So the Bhagavatam has a vision that we all are meant to mold our life in a way that we are remembering Krishna mm -hmm. and through all our activities. And when we don't remember Krishna, there are different degrees of dysfunction, 
disintegration and even uh, degradation that may result <laughs> that's what we certainly saw in this past time. Now, now it's interesting yeah. the, the whole the whole uh what set the whole thing off is Daksha felt insulted by the way that Shiva responded or let's say neglected to respond to him but it becomes revealed that the part of the reason or maybe the entire reason why Lord Shiva didn't stand in that moment and greet him as all others did was because his mind was at that moment deeply absorbed in Lord Vishnu <laughs> he was like actually yes. in meditation at that time um, and yeah. so we see one character, Lord Shiva, who he appears, let's say, a dharmic in a sense, or he, in, in other words, on the surface level, the way he's dressed, appears very dirty. Um, he's wearing a garland of skulls, right? He, he's covered in ash. Um, from an external point of view, or from, let's say, from Duksha's, let's say, more religious background, he might judge that as... Um, Mm -hmm. unworthy or condemnable in some way although he was his conscious uh, Shiva's consciousness was actually exactly where his religion is meant to end up right like deeply absorbed in God That's true. yeah whereas it, Daksha he, he's this person he's got all this respect in this position and so on you know and he's living in this very Vedic or religious uh, context and apparently very rigidly you know very properly but his consciousness seems to be prone to anger, you know, a, a need for prestige. Um, y y um, ultimately, he made so many bad choices that led to the, 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 the um, let's say, condemnation by his daughter, the suicide of his daughter, the chaos of his whole, you know, mm -hmm. religious ceremony was disrupted. But it seems like it's pointing us to what in today's language a lot of people would refer to as say the distinction between religion and spirituality that you have a religious context on one side you have a spiritual context on the other side and uh, we, we got to see kind of a uh, juxtaposition of the two. Oh, and I'm afraid that Chaitanya Charan has frozen up on us <laughs> right as we're getting to the, the juicy stuff. So I'm, I'm hoping that he's oh, here we go. You're back for yeah, I'm can you hear me? Did you hear what I? Yes. What, I'm not sure if you heard what I said. No, we lost you for it. about thirty seconds. Thirty seconds. Okay. I, well, where I got was I said that in one, in one, it seems like in a, in our modern vernacular, we might frame this, uh, this, this incident in the, in the 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 juxtaposition of the two characters, Daksha and Shiva, as the difference between religion in the case of Daksha and spirituality in the case of Shiva. Yeah, that's nicely put. I was thinking of the same thing. We could call that uh, Shiva is, in one sense, spiritual, but not religious. Mm -hmm. And Daksha is religious, but not spiritual. Right. Now, so, so yeah, why, why don't we, def could you help us define those terms? Like, because I think it's very popular yeah. for people. I, you know, I forget the statistic. I mean, you, you may even know it, but, but like, mm. from what I understand, the, um, there's a very large percentage of people in Western countries that now identify with no religion, but identify as being spiritual. But what that actually yes. means is not always really well articulated. It can be vague. True. So first thing is that words don't have fixed meanings. The meanings mm -hmm. of words also keep changing. Uh, so 50 years ago, when I, or 50, 70 years ago, when Einstein said that the deeply religious instinct which makes one wonder, uh, where did the universe come from? How does is the order of the universe coming? So when he was using the word religious, most people would today use the word spiritual. Right. So, so let's uh, look at first, when people say spiritual but not religious, in what sense are the words being used? Mm -hmm. Now that's not the only sense in which the words are used. Sometimes when two people use the word in two different senses, then then there can be a lot of confusion. So Conflict where there really is none. Yeah. Like maybe they're true. actually in agreement, but they have different ideas of what the terms mean. Yeah, exactly. So if we consider when somebody says, I'm, I'm spiritual, but not religious, but they have a particular conception of religion in their mind. Hmm. And I read somewhere that people associate religion with three things, basically. That is ritualism, intolerance, 
and uh, you could say institutionalization bureaucracy uh, basically that those three things are that you get you you are made to believe certain things you are made to do certain things and overall you give up your reasoning faculty your free will your capacity mm -hmm. to take responsible decisions so in that okay. sense ritual, ritualism <clears throat> dogmatism you could say another word you could use it this is what mm -hmm. i do this is what i believe and this is whom i follow there's some institutionalization some hierarchy is there whom i follow and these three are generally considered to be quite unpalatable and there mm, is reason sure. for that yeah there is a reason for that that uh, all these three have led to people acting in uh, less uh, less than exemplary ways to put it mildly so the, when people say i'm not religious i'm spiritual that means they say I, I don't want to be dogmatic i don't want to be ritualistic and i definitely don't want to to be like a, simply a mere mouthpiece for somebody else to speak through me i'm not a puppet in somebody else's hands no. so I, so so that sense is definitely valid if you see the bhagavad gita at its end states that vimrishyata dasheshena yathechitha kuru krishna says deliberate deeply and then you mm -hmm. do as you desire mm -hmm. so krishna is not calling upon arjuna for simply obedience in one sense krishna within the bhagavad gita's vision is god although he is god he doesn't draw upon his godhood to demand obedience if that's what he had wanted then he could have just completed the bhagavad gita in six words i am god <laughs> obey me fight and that could have <laughs> that could have been the entire gita but he doesn't do that hmm? so the idea is the bhagavad gita itself is a book of deliberation so that aspect mm -hmm. of being dogmatic or irrational the bhagavad gita does not support that hmm? then another thing that the bhagavad gita is in the last verse is one of its concluding verses sarva dharman parityajya maam ekam sharanam raja so that can be actually said to be a call to give up religiosity sarva dharman parityajya that mm -hmm. ritualism specifically give up all rituals give up all ritualistic ideas of what you should be doing and maam ekam sharanam raja do the things that will help you come closer to me that will help you evolve spiritually so that you come closer to me so <clears throat> so in that sense this 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 apprehension of either dogmatism or ritualism which is there with respect to religion the bhagavad gita's approach is not is far different from that so when somebody says i want to be spiritual uh, what they generally mean is they are open to some higher experiences they want some meaning and purpose in their life they want uh, right. to uh they want to you could say gain a certain level of self mastery rise above the emotions and the drives that otherwise normally control us be more forgiving be more composed so these are the broad associations with the word spiritual that's my understanding you, know, you can also you can also elaborate on your experiences about what spiritual but not religious means when people use yeah. it in that sense well yeah you know i there are a few things that i think of you know that um the, what i think people are getting at when they're when they're discussing the difference between the two and, and and one would be that religion seems to be focused on differences right and judgment uh it, it's it's pointing out differences it's it's you know here are the sinners and here are the followers of god you know um whereas spirituality seems to be focused more on the commonality in in all living beings uh spirituality is you know generated or or lives in that space where we're kind of recognizing the oneness and, and there's more of a of a mood of acceptance than judgment um an another thing i think of is when it comes to regulations and rules and so on you know religion is in one sense i think what we see in daksha is it's almost like the regulation is and i would say this is a shallow understanding of religion but we're we're speaking in kind of like generalities or or stereotypes right now but the stereotype of religion is that the regulation itself is practically like if you follow the regulation you are successful at religion whereas with spirituality the value of the regulation is in relation to the transformation that the regulation is meant to facilitate and if you actually transform and become like the things that you mentioned more more forgiving more kind more d deeply contemplative more 
internally connected to God. If you've achieved that state, then actually the regulation itself can be neglected, you know, because you've already achieved the goal of the, of the regulation. All right. So, so commonly the religious person is thinking, I, I follow all these regulations, but they may have had no transformation whatsoever. Um, and then a third, I, I was just thinking, you know, it seems that religion is very focused on salvation. The idea that I've committed sin, or even I'm sinful by nature, right? I was created in sin, and I'm seeking salvation. I'm seeking relief from the consequences of that sin. Therefore, I do my regulations. Therefore, I follow these certain rules. Therefore, I profess my faith. Uh, whereas spirituality, is, is, it's, it more begins with the idea that by nature, I'm not sinful. By nature, I'm actually pure, and what I want to do is revive that purity and get back to that. So it seems that one, you know, one is, it, it seems to have a darker kind of tone to it. You know, you're sinful, you, you better bow down now, otherwise you're, you know, you're, you're condemned to the results of your sin. And the other one is like, no, 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 you are a bright, beautiful, divine light, you know, <laughs> and, and somehow you're out of touch with that. Mm. You need to, you need to recover that. You know, it's, those are some thoughts in my mind about the difference between the two. Yeah, that's a very important one. Actually, rules. I was recently at an interfaith conference, and there was a Christian pastor who was speaking. They had done some survey among the youth. What is your conception of a priest? As mm -hmm. one one youth from some University of America, he said, a priest is someone who is constantly worried that someone somewhere is having some fun. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's so great. <laughs> so often the rules are seen to be meant to deprive us of all the enjoyable things of life. Right. Now, that is not the purpose at all. But regulation does seem to evoke rules and regulations. Uh, do this, don't do this. They, don't, they do seem to evoke that kind of response. And mm -hmm. religion is quite, quite often associated with that. Yeah. And uh, now to some extent, uh, to take go to the other side now, and the rules themselves are not inherently uh, restrictive or undesirable. Right. To do anything, we need rules. Even if you want to play a sports, if you want somebody also play cricket or tennis. Now, if nobody follows rules, then there will be no game. You know, if uh, so, in that sense, rules themselves are not bad. But the problem comes when somebody is told to follow the rules without being told the purpose of the rules. Mm -hmm. So, you know, why should you hit the ball like this and not like that in sport, in, in football or in cricket or in any other sports? What is the point of it all? So over the years, many times, many of the religions of the world have focused more on, more on just adherence to the rules with uh, with a call for faith. If you do this, then one day you'll attain salvation. One day you'll get liberated. You'll be saved. But how exactly, for how following that particular rule leads to an evolution of consciousness. It leads to a transformation that is not so much described. So in mm -hmm. one sense, if you, you could say that rules, they are like the fences on a road. Regulation is meant to help us go on a particular road. But if I don't see the road, if I don't have the light to see what road I'm going along, then what is the point of following the following any regulation at all? So this is where maybe I could uh, elaborate a little bit on spirituality, what we mean in from a, okay. more from the Gita's perspective. Hmm? Yeah. You want to? Okay. So no, that sounds three really great. Things, yeah. Yeah. So in my understanding, the word spirituality can refer to three things. The most okay. common thing which people refer to is a state of mind, an emotion. Oh, I feel very spiritual. That means if I feel very calm. I feel very contented. I feel very relaxed. Mm. That's the idea of spirituality. At spiritual peace. state of mind. Yeah. At peace, yeah. Or peace, connected, whole. Now that's definitely one part of spirituality. But there is some there's a lot more to it. The way the Bhagavad Gita explains it, spirituality is not just a state of mind, it is also a level of reality. Mm -hmm. It's a level of reality. There is, there is the body, which is physical, which is one level of reality. And there's the soul, which is spiritual. That is another level of reality. So that's the second aspect. And from the Bhagavad Gita's perspective, that is the fundamental differentiation. 
वॉट इज मटीरियल इज दैट विच इज टेम्पररी ना सतो विद्यते भावो ना भावो विद्यते सता एंड एवरीथिंग मटीरियल इज टेम्पररी एंड वी लॉन्ग फॉर थिंग्स दैट आर इंडियोरिंग एंड दैट्स वाई इन वन सेंस द ह्यूमन सर्च फॉर सिक्योरिटी इट मे बी थ्रू आर सिक्योरिटी शुड बी थ्रू वी आर फिजिकल हेल्थ थ्रू आर बैंक बैलेंस through various social arrangements the search for security is ultimately a search for spirituality and a search for spirituality is not in a vague sense it is a search for spiritual reality so that is there is a there is a level of reality which is spiritual and when one gets to that level of spiritual spiritual reality then naturally one experiences the state of mind which we call as spiritual hmm. so so in much of contemporary parlance spirituality is seen as a state of mind as a emotional state of emotions state of mind but how do you get that state of mind that state of mind is actually connected with a level of reality okay. and then a third aspect of spirituality is the process to get to that level of reality so for example yoga meditation prayer mantra chanting these are all spiritual what do we mean by that that means they are uh, they are pathways or processes for getting to that level of reality hmm. and so if we can com- compare say a mount a metaphor of a mountain so somebody is at the bottom of a mountain and they they get a glimpse of the peak of the mountain maybe it's a very there's a lot of clouds over there there is a th- uh, thick cover of by a green wilder of greenery because of which they don't see the peak of the mountain but the peak of the mountain is extremely beautiful hmm. when they get a glimpse of that peak it's one of the one of the most uplifting sights they have ever had so getting that occasional sight of some that higher reality that is like the spiritual state of mind that leads to what we call as spiritual experiences so i may be at the bottom of the mountain but from there i might occasionally get a glimpse of the peak of the mountain Mm-hmm. so i experience that this oh it was such a spiritual experience for me in a say so that's wonderful if somebody has a spiritual experience like that at the same time i'm still right now at the bottom of the mountain and i have not yet got to the top of the mountain that's why i may have a very profound spiritual experience today and tomorrow i may just go back to relapse to my normal way of living which has very little spiritual in it mm mm-hmm. so that's why if i am at the bottom of the mountain and i have a glimpse that there is the top of the mountain it is extraordinarily beautiful then i need a path to get to the top of the mountain mm-hmm. i need a path to get so spirituality can refer to these three things the there is the top of the mountain is a particular level of reality so that is the spiritual reality then second is the glimpse of that spiritual reality that is the spiritual state of mind or spiritual experience and third is the pathway to get to that reality okay the pathway to get to that reality mm-hmm. so we so reality state of mind and pathway so all these three are what people uh, what we can say broadly refer to spirituality now uh, what has happened in uh, in it's not just in contemporary world you can say even in dakshas times is that sometimes people follow a particular path which is actually meant to take me to the top of the mountain but i follow that path for some other purposes maybe i am in a society where doing those religious activities gives me a sense of prestige gives me a sense mm-hmm. of respect and i am actually going up that bound path but i am not going all the way up the path i am just going a little bit up i'm saying how much higher than everyone else i am and i'm proud of that <laughs> so in one sense i am going up but i am not looking up i am looking down Mm-hmm. i'm looking down to see how much lower than me everyone else is so that could be somebody is following a path that can take them up but they are themselves that they are not, not actually really going up their consciousness is still down so mm-hmm. that's what happens when sometimes the people who are following something religious they they end up with a holier than thou attitude that i am i am i am better than you are what you said about acceptance versus judgment the judgmentality yeah. is a very strong characteristic of people who are religious but not spiritual mm-hmm. because if i am really spiritual okay i may be high up and i may be much higher up than everyone else 
but my vision will be how much higher up there is to go for me and that will bring humility if i am not if i look up to the distance that i have to go what awaits mm-hmm. me in the future that brings humility but if i use my my practices whatever i am practicing to look down at others then that brings judgment judgmentality that brings condemnation that brings um, an overall attitude of we could say discrimination this in a in a negative sense mm-hmm. and that's uh, that's very unhealthy now i was in texas and i think i mentioned this in one of my earlier podcasts i saw one poster uh, a car bumper that person had written that oh god please save me from your preachers yes <laughs> from your followers <laughs> yes <laughs> so the idea is the preachers have a holier than thou attitude i don't want anything to do with such people right. so if i'm on that path but i'm looking down then that is something which is ritualistic so daksha if you go back to our past time the daksha was looking he was not looking up he, it was a religious gathering where a sacrifice was to be performed a, re- a ceremony was there uh, which uh, yagya was to be performed over there but for him that yagya it didn't have so much of a spiritual import as a social import that yagya was not to direct one's consciousness towards the divine mm. the yagya was oh i am performing such a such a elaborate ceremony just see how prosperous i am how pious i am and when that was his vision what happened was if i am doing something to gain respect from others then if i see people are not respecting me then it becomes unbearable what why am i doing this right. how dare somebody not respect me? so how dare somebody not respect me <laughs> what's the point to all this <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. so he was religious in the sense that he was doing this fire sacrifice but he was not spiritual he was not thinking of the ultimate purpose of the fire sacrifice mm. on the other hand lord shiva he was there now he was not religious in the sense that he was not dressed appropriately for that particular occasion he didn't follow the external etiquette of offering respects to daksha when he came but it was not it was not you could say the the not what you earlier said about not following a particular regulation mm-hmm. it was not the because of the regulation was, yeah he was not bec- it was not because he was eager ignorant or disrespectful it was just he was transcendental hmm. he was at a higher level of consciousness that's why i said he was spiritual but not religious right. whereas daksha was religious but not spiritual right mm-hmm. okay that this is very interesting now, now we've just dis- you've you've just described uh potential in in one sense we could understand these te- these two terms as synonymous but what we're doing is we're speaking about them we're we're creating the distinction between them that is commonly held we're trying to articulate it and and show how okay. they could be understood different right which is fine okay. and and i think just one even minute, one like minute. yes yes sorry yeah, yeah. regarding the synonymous and difference i forgot to mention one thing generally yeah. when i talk about spiritual meaning three things the state of mind the level of reality and the process the process yes. to attain that level of reality or attain that state of mind so generally that process is what is called as religion right mm-hmm. but many people if they don't know okay there is a higher level of reality to be attained then then what happens is they just do the religion without the spirituality so we could they say they haven't that, seen they haven't seen the peak of the mountain but maybe yeah. they but they have no genuine spiritual experience but they have a fear of of the consequences of their sin yes so they take up the process yes that's true that they have now even religion itself is not necessarily a bad thing you know, that at some level some some level of fear of accountability or fear mm-hmm. or accountability that is that is good in one sense but if you consider in terms of any relationship say a uh, a parent child relationship the children should have a healthy fear of their parents but at the same time the relationship cannot always stay at that level of fear it has to evolve to higher levels if it doesn't then it becomes problematic if fear is the basic denominator for the relationship then eventually 
once a person once the child grows up and feels that now i have my autonomy i have my own independence then that relationship rather than evolving it devolves it leads to rebellion it leads to rejection and that's what quite often happens when people follow religion out of that fear or if i don't do this i'll get some bad things will happen to me and eventually they start feeling that oh, okay now there are so many people who are not doing what i am doing here not bad things are not happening to them or i did so many things and still something bad happened to me so that f- level of fear is not is it's a it's a very preliminary level of practice and right. shila prabhupa shila prabhupa if we consider the way he presents the bhagavatam in the fifth canto there are quite vivid description of the you will come to the fifth canto later that the descriptions of the consequences of our actions mm-hmm. but prabhupa practically never spoke in those terms if you if you do this you will go to this particular hellish condition or that particular hellish and condition suffer yeah his focus was more on we are spiritual beings and we are meant for something higher than temporary pleasures so the approach was not you could say fear driven but more of intelligence or philosophy centered okay and there is meant we are meant for something higher in life then why settle for something lower so that's would be the second platform you're describing of the, the let's understand reality right yes let's Through, understand reality right perfect yeah so okay yeah, so, so another so, thing, so, okay so if i this is spiritual spirituality if i consider spirituality like a big circle within that there is the philosophy aspect and there is the religion aspect they are like mm-hmm. two circles within that spiritual circle mm-hmm. or you could say that you know these are two circles which overlap with the sp- with the spirituality circle now religion mm-hmm. can extend outside the spirituality circle also where somebody may be religious but not spiritual mm-hmm. and philosophy can also extend outside the spirituality circle where somebody may come up with some philosophy but that has nothing to do with any ultimate reality in the sense okay. that i i call it as not philosophy but philosophy no. <laughs> <laughs> philosophy philosophy means the sophistry of fools the sophistry okay. the false logic of fools now there was one philosopher he said that life is meaningless life is meaningless and miserable therefore the only philosophical question worth asking is whether to commit suicide today or tomorrow right now oh, that is such a unfortunate such a tragic way of looking at life so mm. that's not very helpful so but broadly <laughs> 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 so this is spirituality is like a circle and you could say philosophy and religion are two circles within them now both, okay yeah. if i might just so, so you just clarify something i find that's very helpful you said there are these three aspects to spirituality one is the spiritual consciousness which is the yeah. top of the mountain and which is the goal and then the second one is you could say now you're you're kind of characterizing as the philosophy the understanding of reality and okay. then the third and then the third one was the the path the rituals the the practices the regulations etc that you follow to move towards that that um that top ultimate of top of the mountain to yeah. the goal to the spiritual consciousness and so what what you what you're pointing out is that and what bhagavatam points out right like bhagavatam will, mm. will begin by saying all of the regulations that you practice if they're not leading to remembrance of krishna which is the spiritual experience then they're a waste of time mm-hmm. right yes. and, and, and similarly one's philosophy if also not engaged for that purpose is also a mis a misuse of it and so what bhagavatam is trying to do is align like all three get understand what the the spiritual goal is um understand what reality is so that you so that you, you, everything becomes clear to you and understand and and take the practices that that are laid out the, the the quote unquote religious practices and engage them for no other purpose but for achieving that yes. goal and if you get too caught up if you have very dim if you if you have a very if you have a very um if you don't have a a clear picture of that spiritual goal or what spiritual experience is and sometimes we get glimpses of that and sometimes or it's 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 spoken to us but if you don't have that clear in the mind then it's likely that you get too caught up in just the the ritual if you don't have also an exemplar right like someone who is deeply spiritual 
it's it is mm -hmm. easy to get caught up in, on that on that level of the ritual of the religious of the process the process means everything but it's not even moving in the direction of the of the goal yeah it's beautifully but if you connect this in the nature of rea understanding the nature of reality is the purpose of philosophy and then uh, uh, outlining the path to get to that higher level of reality that is that is you could say essentially religion religion yeah. is means to bind us to connect us to link us with the ultimate uh, ultimate reality now the journey is a journey of consciousness so what is it that is the bottom of the mountain and what is meant to get to the top of the mountain is our consciousness mm -hmm. so now it is a consciousness which experiences and within the consciousness there can be many different experiences we have in fact we can say at every moment we are experiencing something some experiences are relatively more memorable of many are many are very easily forgettable but beyond whatever experiences we have there is the experiencer mm -hmm. and the experiencer can rise to a higher level of reality so at one level spirituality is such that anybody can experience the spiritual anywhere i may be right at the bottom of the mountain but sometimes because of some reason i might just get a glimpse of the top of the mountain mm -hmm. so so some of some of if you look at the history of spiritual people across the world sometimes when they are in the midst of great distress or in the middle of they are in the middle of some some even doing some depraved actions at that time suddenly they have an awakening sometimes mm -hmm. some people can have an awakening in a more sanctified kind of uh, more of a spiritual kind of place but you get a glimpse so the experience is wonderful whenever we have it but for that experience to become regular there has to be the journey of consciousness and so if we consider the uh, the nectar of devotion the bhakti samat sindhu it doesn't talk so much about spiritual experiences as spiritual states mm -hmm. spiritual states so experience is something which can come and go but a state is relatively more steady So if I'm at the bottom of the mountain, I can get some glimpses of the top, but yeah. if my consciousness has journeyed upward, then the vision of the top becomes much steadier. Right. So, so we want to go toward that spiritual state of consciousness. That's, that's state so of, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I was because I was trying to think. You know, I think most people that are using these terms and so on. You know, it, 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 there's a gradation of. their understanding of even what they're trying to say sometimes their own experience can be a little bit hard to articulate or, or even understand like for instance i think a lot of times when people that identify as spiritual when they speak about spirituality or their own spiritual experience often it'll have to do with the connection to nature right like for, for instance yesterday i just where i'm staying there's a river near very beautiful river nearby and uh a quiet spot and i just went there i went there alone and you know and i dove into the river and i spent time there and i'm looking up the river and i see you know the river there's a waterfall like a small waterfall that the river is coming in and i can see the mountains in the background where the river is originating and you know i think people when they find themselves particularly alone in nature um they can begin to feel like they their their daily experience of responsibilities and pressures and anxieties and so on is set aside and in that moment they begin to think about god or they begin to think about their own let's say maybe their own mortality or or the, you know they begin to look at their life from a new perspective and they begin to feel uh, maybe they come in contact with an animal and they look at that animal and they feel a certain sense of um communion with that animal and so on and 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 I believe that in one sense we can say this this is valid spiritual quote unquote spiritual experience you know that that their consciousness is momentarily awakening uh to yes. to spiritual reality beyond their daily grind yes, but as you were saying now that to reach that state and, and deeper states of that like you know that is where spiritual practice is meant to take us yeah definitely in the gita there is a concept called vibhuti in fact the whole mm -hmm. 10th chapter is called as vibhuti now vibhuti bhuti means existence or manifestation vibhuti means 
a special existence or special manifestation. So the the way I explain Vibhuti is like the one above the many manifests as the one among the many. The one above the, the, the many manifests as the one among the many. Manifests as the one among the many. Uh -huh. So that could be in that nature, we could say if we see a river, a mountain, a rainbow, these are one among many things existing within this world. But when we perceive them, we experience something beyond, we are not just when we see the beauty of a mountain, we see the beauty of a rainbow, we are not just perceiving that particular structure, we are experiencing something higher through it. Mm -hmm. So it is an experience of the divine. So this can apply to various things. It can, even Krishna says, actually, Jayosmi Vavasa Yosmi. He says, I am adventure and I am victory. So when some people have these uh, living on the edge kind of sports, jumping, bungee jumping from a, a mountain mm -hmm. top or a, from <laughs> yeah. a plane, the thrill that they're experiencing is actually an experience of God. So the Gita tells us that the, the, our deepest experiences are actually our experiences of Krishna. Whatever is the deepest experience we have, that is our experience of Krishna. Mm -hmm. However, we may not realize that we are experiencing Krishna. Right. You may say, oh, this is something special. This, this is something extraordinary. But what is it? One of my main services is writing. So I've, I was reading about the celebrated writers of the last century. And among the top 10 writers, almost everyone ended up with a severe depression. You know, seven, eight of them committed suicide. And... You know, I read a little bit about it, what exactly happened. And one of the authors, she wrote that I just cannot, I cannot bear living with the thought that my best is behind me, not ahead of me. Mm -hmm. right. Now, what she meant by that was that actually when somebody is creative, somebody, uh, somebody is say, writing something and they really write something well, at that time, it's not just their, their writing. It's almost like they connect with some, some source of ideas and energy from above, which works through them. And that's how they've been able to write something which becomes a, becomes a classic. And then mm -hmm. now next time when they try to write it, they're just not able to do it. Because that right. higher, higher reality that is manifesting through them, it's no longer manifest. And then it becomes unbearable. Now, I was this good a musician. I was this good a writer. <laughs> right. Now, I'm not able to do that. Just not able to do that. So that experience mm. of, now the many words, even professional circles use the word of flow. So I'm, I'm in a flow now. So that's a state of yeah. peak performance. So that is also actually ex experience of, of the divine, experience of the, sp of the spiritual. The, the point is that we all experience something higher during various courses of life. So suppose somebody is watching a cricket match and or any sports match or maybe somebody is even watching a TV show and somebody is acting very well over there. Mm -hmm. Then they're captivated by that. So anything special that draws mm -hmm. our attention, the Bhagavad Gita says that is a manifestation of the divine. Right. Recognize it. Yeah, yeah it is a manifestation of the divine. The challenge, however, is that although everything attractive comes from the divine, everything attractive may not take us toward the divine. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> <laughs> no, a, so a essentially, yeah, so, so I can, ha somebody can have spiritual experiences by, through any means practically. But will those means steadily take me toward the spiritual level of reality? Hmm? That mm -hmm. is the key question. So these extraordinary gotcha. experiences, we all have at various times. And when we have those experiences, what do we do after that? Uh, we need to, then we need to explore, okay, what is the way I can, I can progress toward getting those, ex getting those experiences on a regular basis. Right. So, so, th so in other words, Bhagavad Gita isn't, it's saying that there is such a thing as a very deep, constant state of spiritual consciousness. And yes. you may have experiences in this world that are temporary glimpses of something glorious 
that gives you some access to experiencing that momentarily or for, for some point of time. But the value of that is it's meant to inspire one to follow the path to the steady, like Krishna will use words like satatam yuktanam or nitya, yeah. nitya yukta, where you're yes. always connected to that spiritual source, always connected. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's true. Like, say, if I go close to nature, if I see a beautiful mountain, one day I may, f I may have like a f flow of thoughts, which are very uplifting. But the next day I go in front of the mountain and I feel nothing over there. <laughs> it's okay, it's there, what's the big deal about it? So what has happened is yeah. it's, it's, you could say that the object is not the source of the experience. The object is the stimulus for the experience. Right. And the, the that, source is, it's, a, it's one small manifestation of the source, but it's yes. not the source itself. Yeah. So, so for, it is when our consciousness becomes more elevated, more attuned, then we can perceive the spiritual at various places. So what happens is when somebody is religious, so going back to our theme of spiritual but not religious, if mm -hmm. somebody is, is too caught in being religious only, then they think that even if they have an understanding of the spiritual, they think that the spiritual will manifest only through is XYZ ways, ABC ways. Mm -hmm. That only when you go to a temple and pray to God, that's when you'll experience something spiritual. If you go right. close to nature, what you're experiencing, that is just mundane. It is just something mundane, feel good. Well, no, that can also be spiritual. So when you say religious, but not spiritual, what happens is we reduce spirituality to certain predefined uh, rituals or predefined dogmas. And that is unhealthy. On the other hand, if somebody says I'm spiritual, but not religious. And in that sense, they reject all religion completely. Then what happens yeah. is they reduce spirituality only to a set of experiences which are highly inconsistent and unpredictable, non-replicable. I sometimes mm -hmm. get it, for many times I don't get it. So that's no why, we, yeah, there's no path, there's no, there's, no path. there's no transformative process. Yeah, so that's why in one sense, if you consider Krishna consciousness, it is, you could say it is spiritual and religious. However, it yes. is first okay. spiritual and then religious. Because Krishna the, begins. The, yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead, please. Yeah. No, because Krishna begins with analyzing the nature of reality. First, he says that our essential core is non material. Our identity transcends our biology and our psychology, both. You know, we exist hmm. different from our bodies, even different from our mind and our emotions. So he begins with the, uh, the spiritual aspect of reality, and then he talks about a pathway. So we, in one sense, to be transformed, to rise to the mountain, top of the mountain, we need to be both spiritual and religious. Religious doesn't mean simply following certain rituals, but adhering to a particular path, having a certain kind of discipline by which we can rise up the mountain. Yeah, I, I love that. You know, and of course, Bhagavatam is, again, is, is starting right there by saying your religion, your regulations and, and so on, they become meaningless if they're not leading to the goal of that path. Yeah, uh, they, they have they have no value then. But you Shiramai know, I, I love what you're saying because yeah, yeah, yeah. Shiramai 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 Shiramai. It's a very strong phrase. It's just a waste of complete time. waste of time. It's complete it's waste. A, of time. It's actually yeah. even stronger. Shiramai Shiramai Shiramai. It's not just a waste of time. It's almost like a, it's a wasted labor. Shiramai is actually not just time. It's it's effort. Yeah, Shiramai is effort, but it's just a wasted effort, wasted labor. Oh, so if one is perfect. not actually go, going toward the top of the mountain. Yeah, but but I I also appreciate what you said because we spent and I think maybe the amongst people in quote unquote spiritual circles we may spend a lot of time condemning the the shallow religious thought that's not leading to that. But it's 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 also prudent for us to to consider, you know, for any person that considers themselves to be spiritual and not religious, is my aversion towards quote unquote religion, you know, is it really because I'm getting to the essence and, and I'm and I'm trying to rid myself of all the cultural baggage that comes with religion, all the guilt and all the repression and and meaningless ritual and so on? Or is that, you know, um, aversion to religion, does it stem from my aversion to regulating myself? <laughs> you know, like, do I actually, yeah. you know, not have the, the self-discipline 
And therefore, I've kind of uh, rationalized that by saying I'm religious and not spiritual, which I think is a very real phenomenon, too. True. What happens is that uh, at one level, disciplining ourselves in any way is painful. The Bhagavad Gita mm. says that that which tastes like poison in the beginning will taste like nectar in the end. Right. But most of us, the nectar seems to be too far away and the poison seems to be too much right now. Yeah. So we say, why, why should I have any kind of discipline? And saying that we're spiritual, I'm spiritual but not religious can lead to a, a rejection of any form of uh, self-discipline, any form of regulation as repression. Hmm. So right. one way I differentiate between regulation and repression is that regulation means it's, if you consider a flow of water. Now, if you have a channel by which the water is directed toward a particular path, and repression means the water is just kept in a center, kept in one, not the, kept in a particular place, without any any direction at all. Mm -hmm. So it's like, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. Okay. Right. What What am I to do? What is the direction? <laughs> <laughs> what is the Where direction? I'm going to do? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, a great. That's a great analogy. Mm -hmm. You know, Prabhu, we're running out of time, but I just thought maybe just to get what, what your thoughts on this, because hearing this comment, you've really clarified some things for me very nicely today. I appreciate it. Um, I'm thinking that when we look at Bhagavad Gita and we look at Bhagavatam, the two, let's say, most fundamental bhakti shastras, the two most important texts that delineate, delineate the, you know, what is bhakti, what, what is bhakti practice, how to understand bhakti, how to practice bhakti. Um, it seems to me like you could, you could um, characterize the purpose of these books as distinguishing, as the encouragement to transcend religiosity and take it to the spiritual level that's where gita starts and it seems like that's where they both start and, and in one sense not only do they start there but like they begin and end there it's, it, it almost seems like the central purpose to, to them you know arjuna he gives religious arguments at the beginning of the bhagavad gita and then krishna's response to them in the second chapter you know is and, and right up to the end you know but beginning of the second chapter you know he's saying if you're just concerned with with you know you're 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 afraid of getting sinful reactions you're afraid of bad karma you're afraid mm -hmm. of you know the, the bad reactions and you live your life you know pursuing good reactions and avoiding bad reactions um then you never achieve samadhi you never achieve a deep sense of s spiritual experience you know bogaishvarya prasaktanam taya right samadho you never you never achieve anything uh deeply spiritual um and it, then it goes, you know, then the Gita will go great lengths to, to give, you know, Arjuna, in one sense, in the second chapter, asks, well, what is, what, tell me, what does the spiritual person look like? You know, like, how do they act? How do they yeah, behave? How do they walk? How do they sit? You know, and then we begin to hear, uh, like, the spiritual qualities, you know, even mindedness under all different circumstances, et cetera, et cetera. And Bhagavatam, same thing, as we're saying, like, you know, it's setting out to kind of reject you know, we're hearing about Daksha here, we're gonna hear about Daksha again, you know, where again, he kind of like offends a deeply spiritual person with his religious, seeing his religious duties as as superior or more important. And, but in one sense, it's almost as if all the stories in Bhagavatam are illustrating this point from different angles. Yes, definitely. In one sense, uh, if you consider the Bhagavatam, the Bhagavatam is talking about, it's, it's spoken to the King Parikshit, and Parikshit mm -hmm. is actually a very religious king. You know, he mm -hmm. respects the sages. He's himself following the, he's not only following, but he's ensuring that religious virtue is maintained in society. He uh, he disciplines the, the dark age of, the personified age of Kali, who is trying to spread his religion. <coughs> but even after all that, what happens to him is, he's cursed. He's cursed mm -hmm. to die in seven days. So in right. one sense, <clears throat> if somebody is only religious without being spiritual, we, we use religious in the you do good, you'll get good. You do bad, you'll get bad. That's with broadly the religious worldview. But that religious worldview eventually leads to frustration. Because in the world, we can say that whether we do good or whether we do bad, ultimately everybody has to grow old, everybody has to get deceased, everybody has to die. And if we mm. look, if our religious worldview leads us to expect fairness in the world 
we will end up with frustration so so what happens is uh, when he's cursed in that way he could very well have asked no, i was so virtuous i was so religious i was doing all my duties so well but he didn't get frustrated he saw that curse where he was to die in seven days as an opportunity to rise to the spiritual level of consciousness hmm. where he put aside so so even if religion doesn't make one dogmatic even if religion doesn't make one judgmental even if religion doesn't make one uh, irrational but even then religion alone cannot really equip us to face life's challenges this right. is one of the one of the key reasons why people lose faith see i did so much for my religion for my god and still why are so many sufferings coming in my life so arjuna at the beginning of the gita is right there as yes. well yeah see arjuna he's i was going to talk about that also that that he was actually he had a good ethical dilemma now he's a good person should i fight to maintain the king in the kingdom should i fight against my relatives what should i do he was torn between two duties the duty of protecting his citizens from a ruler who was an aggressor exploiter and duty of protecting his dynasty because mm. that exploiter was a member of his dynasty so what do, what does he do at that time so that so ultimately just a religious world view it's it has its value but life's life's frustrations will eventually bring us to a place where even our religion will not be adequate and that's where if the spiritual dimension is there then we can rise toward the higher consciousness gotcha. otherwise we can't uh, we can, we will we will end up frustrated so i said that there is we, we, there is we, we, or as bhagavad gita will say we won't achieve atma supersidity the complete satisfaction yeah supersidity you know there is yeah. there is what you talk about salvation you know there is release from distress and there is relief amid distress mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. we could say the ultimate purpose is that we want to release from distress that is the state of that of attaining the top of the mountain but if somebody is expecting that my religious practices in this world i'll get release from distress that's not going to happen but if my, my religious practices can help me raise my consciousness raise my consciousness above my situations by circumstances then we can experience relief even amid the distress the distress is there but our consciousness rises above they like i'm the bottom of the mountain there is a flood there is a famine there is a volcano but if my consciousness is risen above then i am not affected by that so that's why yes religious practice is important but the most important thing is is understanding the spiritual and pursuing the spiritual prabhu you have as always been uh, very helpful and enlightening and illuminating to us i thank you for joining us again we plan on bringing you back many many times but uh, it, it's been a pleasure having you here today thank you so much thank you bro it's wonderful having this discussion hey krishna <laughs>